Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Glad to see everybody. Miss Tiffany, glad you're back. Uh, we're going to be reading uh, out of the second chapter of James, starting in the 14th verse. But let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we do thank you for this, another day that you've given us, Lord. We, we thank you for Jesus that you've given us that would come and die on the cross and shed his life blood so that we could be with you in heaven. We thank you, Jesus, for laying down your life for us. Thank you, Lord, for this word that we have that you preserved for us through the ages. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, give us a greater will and desire for the study and, and understanding of it. Pray, Lord, for our pastor as he brings the message today and our praise team as they glorify you in song. Pray, Lord, that you just be with us all today and that we would understand and know that we're here for a purpose, and that purpose is to serve you and to tell others about you. Pray that you forgive me where I fail you, make me useful in your sight, and that I would honor and glorify you in all that I do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Let's go to James chapter 2, starting in verse 14. It's, uh, Pastor and I were talking about this the other day. Faith without works is dead. So this, this is a good scripture here. All of it is, but this, is, this has been laid on my heart. So let's start with 14. He says, uh, James says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have work? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, then one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works? When she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Hope I correctly read that. All right. Get up, greet everybody, shake somebody's hand, hug your neck, tell them how much you love them.
over the building, just lift up your hands and tell the Lord he's welcome here this morning. Come on, just begin to use your mouth, tell him that you love him. Lord, we welcome your presence here this morning. They may not want you anywhere else, Lord, but you are welcome here. And Father, as we lift our hands and we sing our song, let your glory and your presence begin to dwell in here. Come and dwell with us this morning. We give you glory. We give you honor, God. You've been way too good for us not to praise you this morning. You've seen us through too much, Father, for us just to sit still and be quiet. But Lord, here at By His Blood Ministry this morning, we will lift our hands. We will sing songs, God. We will give you praise and we will give you honor in Jesus' name. How many of you come to praise him this morning? Say amen. amen. How many of you has been good to you? Say amen. amen. How many of you determined this morning you're going to give him the best praise you got? Say amen. amen. Lord, we love you. Come on, say it. Lord, we love you. Make yourself welcome, Lord. Lord, we love you.
Lord, we thank you, God, for your presence that's here. Lord, we love you. We're nothing without you, God, but through you we are everything this morning. I pray, God, that you change our hearts and our lives, Lord. Show yourself strong. Lord, you're faithful. You're great. You're worthy of all of our praise this morning. Regardless of our situation, regardless of what it looks like, Lord, you are worthy this morning. Lord, we just give you praise and honor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, let's really concentrate on praising you this morning. Don't get weary in your worship. Great is your mercy toward me, your loving kindness toward me, your tender mercy I see day after day. How many of you have a cell phone? I want you to get your cell phone out and Google the words of this song. Yeah, I'm asking you to get your phone out during church. <laughs> I want you to Google Donnie McClurk and Great Is Your Mercy. And I want every mouth in here to sing it. Is your mercy toward me, your loving kindness toward me, great is your mercy. Today. Once you have it, hold your phone up in the air so I know you got it. Forever faithful to me, you're always providing for me. Great is your mercy towards me. Great Everybody sing, we're gonna start with verse one, great.
I want to hear your voice and say it. Say it. Great is your of you know that to be true. He's so faithful this morning. He's forever Say it again, great. Great is your mercy. I want you to really think about it this morning. Look at everything he's brought you through. Look where he's placed you this morning. All the sickness, all the illness, all the death. Look where you are this morning. Sounds different coming from everybody, don't it? Because it means something different. Praise your mercy. Everybody's story is different. So it's going to sound different. you to think of something that the Lord has been faithful to you with and say, it's great is your mercy. Where's he been faithful to you? Has he ever let you down? Never. Through the good, the bad, and the ugly, he's faithful.
in this building for so long. The Lord's really pushing us deeper each week in our worship. And it starts with you. All you got to do is just get lost in His presence. Don't worry about who's next to you and who's not here. They're not going through what you're going through. If you want to praise the Lord this morning, you need to do it.
raising my head and he said what are you guys doing <laughs> I'm going to ask you all that same question <laughs> what are you guys doing here what are you doing here <laughs> are you just coming to make yourself feel good or are you really coming here for the purpose of giving God thanks for his mercies that are new every day. Yes. We're giving God thanks for his grace. That grace, that grace that we all so need every day to make it. It made me question myself. What am I doing here? here to mend broken hearts. He's here to give comfort. He's here to be your best friend you'll ever have. He's here whenever you don't think you can put your foot, take a next step. <laughs> He's there to help lift you up. He said to call on me, cry to me, and I will help you. Do we ever cry to him and say, God, help me? Or do we just think, oh, I can do it on my own? You can do it on your own. That's why he's a savior. He's here to save you. He's here to help you. And all he wants is a relationship. Can you just give him a relationship? Can you just be someone to him that he would say, I'm your everything you need? But can you be that to him to receive what he has to give for you? All he's asking is to say, Lord, you're my Savior. I mess up every day. But I know you're there for me. Amen. Come on. And I come into this house, yeah. this church building, glory. to give you glory. Yeah. Because you have sustained me. You've given me so much. And I need to have more joy. I've not been showing a lot of joy lately, but I do have that joy that will give me strength. He is your strength. So I just want to ask you, why are you here? Why? Tell him why you're here. I'm here, God, because I need you. I'm here, God, because I do love you. And I'm here, God, because I want to be amongst your family. Because this is family, guys. We need each other. And you are our family. So let's have a great day of family worship. Because you don't need to be ashamed of who's next door to you or beside you. Because they're your family and they're here because they want to worship God too. Don't be afraid to say, hey, I messed up today, God. But I'm here to worship you because you forgave me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's my mama. She's awesome. Jesus. How many of you received that this morning? Why are you here this morning? That's a good question. She's got me thinking now, why am I here? But why are you here? Are you here to give God praise this morning? Are you here so Pastor Scott don't get on you about where you at? <laughs> no, really. Honestly. Why are you here? Whatever it is, whatever you're going through, whatever you need from the Lord this morning, he's able. And he will meet you right here in the time of your need, whatever it may be. Like I said, everybody's story is different. 
Everybody's faithfulness looks different. Everybody's situation looks different. Where God's pulled you from, it looks different. This is the last time unless the Lord begins to move. your last chance to sing it this morning. Forever!
Somebody ought to give God a good hand clap. Again. Play it right in the middle.
they begging me to quit singing. It's all right to praise him, go ahead. You got every right to. Praise God. Praise God. How many of y'all had fun during praise and worship today? Just clap your hands. See, that's what praise and worship is about. <laughs> it's giving thanks. It's thanking the Lord for all the things that he's given you. And, and just like Teresa said, you know, when someone looks at you and says, what, what are you doing? That's a, that's a great question. That's a question that an adult should be asking. What are we doing here? That's the answer. The answer is we're thanking God. We're thanking God for all the things that he's done for us. We're thanking God for giving us the tools that we need to get through any situation. I asked them to play this song because, because they, each and every day there's a battle that I fight. And I know that there's a battle that you fight that you cannot win on your own. And unless you have God with you, you're going to be defeated. You might look like you're going to win. It may look like you're up on the scoreboard. But in the end, you are going to lose unless you are clinging to God. We're here to thank him for fighting our battles. We're here to thank him for the grace and the mercy that he's shown us through the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And every time I hear that song, th this particular piece of scripture comes to mind. Now, you got to understand that the prophets... I'm going to be speaking from Isaiah today, so uh, we're going to have prophets all day long. But uh, the prophets were not very popular throughout the region because they were sharing the truth of God. They were sharing the, the you know, God says you should be doing this or else this is going to happen. Well, it comes to a point where uh, Elisha, who saw Elijah go up and not taste death, was, was with a young man who was, who was traveling with him. And in, in 2 Kings chapter 6, starting with verse 15, it says, When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So this guy walks out, and they're surrounded by a Syrian army. And it's just Elisha and this young man. And this young man, quite frankly, is scared. Because the Syrian army, one of the most powerful armies at that time, was right there at the doorstep, ready to take them out. Listen to what Elisha said. He said, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, oh Lord, please, open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. 
And when the Syrians came down against them, Elisha prayed. And the Lord said, please strike the people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elijah. And Elijah said to them, this is not the way, this is not the city. Follow me. I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. So even when we feel like we're outnumbered, even when we feel like we're defeated, even when we feel like there's no chance, we have to remember that there's something greater than us. See, that's where we, that's where we fall short. We think, we think that we're the only ones that, that have insight and can solve our problems. When as a matter of fact, it's just the opposite. We are incapable of solving our problems without God, without the tenets of God, without the word of God, without the way of God, without the way that God has constructed things to be. We want to, we want to, to, to link and yoke ourselves to, to pseudoscience, to, to, to false psychology. We want to we wanna take and we want to bring the things of the world and we want, to, we want to try to allow them to outpower God. But the truth of the matter is, there is nothing that is going to win that fight. And if we can, if we can in, install that into our daily lives, take the me out just, just a little bit at a time. God's not asking for an instant 180, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. We, you have to learn. You have to grow. Faith is something that has grown. That's why Jesus compared it to a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds. It doesn't start out as a big tree. It starts out as a little seed. But as you submit little by little by little by little, you let God fight those little battles. If you want to hold on to the big ones, hold on to them. You can continue to lose them. That's, that's cool. But what you'll see is you'll see, hold on, I'm getting these small victories. Maybe I should let him in on this this bigger problem. And now I've got a bigger victory. Well, I'm going to give him this bigger problem. And then you get a bigger victory. And then you give him the next problem. But the thing is, don't forget where those victories come from. That's where we're praising and we're worshiping because we are in remembrance of where our victories come from. So today we celebrate our victory. We've got victory over death. How amazing is that? There is no one here that has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior that is ever going to taste death. How amazing is that? Because when God says eternity, eternity is right there. You leave this earth and then you're standing before Christ. You have victory over death through Christ. There is no opponent here on earth. There is no sin greater than the blood of Christ. You have attained victory over sin through the blood of Christ. There is no enemy that will be able to stand against you. Isaiah 54, 17, tattooed it on my hand for a reason. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. This is the way of the Lord. We are victorious, so we should celebrate like that every week. It should, we shouldn't have to be egged on. We shouldn't have to be brought out of our shells. We should come in ready to celebrate, ready with the mentality that we are going to praise, we are going to worship, and we are going to lift God up to his rightful place so that we can give him honor and pay homage to him. If I could get the elders to the front, please. And guys, here's, here's, the, here's another part of it. I say it every week, I'm not going to give the entire thing, but you've been given something. And uh, we started doing something two weeks ago that I would like to continue to do. I understand that we all have different economic situations. I understand that there may be some people here that cannot put anything into these plates right here. So be it. You are in the house of the Lord. You cannot buy salvation you cannot buy God's love. That's, the, that's one of the things that's different about God's love versus human's love. I can buy human's love in a heartbeat. You don't believe me? All I got to do is find out what they really want. But the other thing about that is the moment that I stop giving them exactly what they want, their love stops. See, God has loved us through giving him all the crap and withholding what he truly wants. 
He's continued to love us through that entire process. So today during tithe and offering, I don't care what it is that you put in that plate. Put something in there. Now, it may be a symbolic gesture, but you know what? Symbolic gestures are all through the Bible. Moses waving his staff was a symbolic gesture. Those plagues were going to happen whether or not he waved his staff or not. Symbolic gesture, put something in there. If you're going to give love, put some love in that plate. If you're going to give knowledge, put some knowledge in that plate. If you're going to, if you're going to put some understanding, put that in the plate. If you're going to put forgiveness, let one of these men know because that is awful heavy and they are older. I don't want them to hurt their backs. But we need to be given forgiveness too. So I want everyone to put something in there today because we have been given so much. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we enter this time of tithe and offering, we are thankful. We are a thankful, thankful group of disciples, Lord, knowing that you have given more than we deserve, Lord. Lord, allow us to pour back out into your kingdom the way that you have ordained. Allow us to celebrate the victories that you have given us and allow us to understand that without you, we would be exactly where we started, lost, confused, and dead, Lord. Lord, thank you for giving us life. Thank you for giving us the life giving grace and mercy that can only come from you, the one true God. Lord, we honor you with our words. We honor you with our, 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 ourselves. And Lord, we honor you with these gifts at this very moment. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen.
Praise God. If everyone will please stand and uh, for the doxology. Oh, okay, so they're already in there. All right, well, praise God. Praise God. Today we are, uh, we are going to be in Isaiah chapter 5, if y'all want to go ahead and turn there. Um, you know, we've been, we've been talking all day uh, about being bold, being thankful, uh, letting the world know why we carry the joy that we carry, and, and it's important that we keep that in mind. But I want to put that into some context also so that we understand what real love looks like. See, we talked about God seeing us through a storm. We talked about the battles that we fought. We've talked about the victories that we've obtained, right? But what's another thing that we do for our children out of love? What is something that we do for our kids out of love? Discipline, absolutely. If we do not love our kids, we will not discipline. We'll let them do whatever they want. You know, we talked in, in Bible study on Wednesday. How many times did Moses say, tell your children this, tell your children this, tell your children this, over and over and over again? If you love your children, you will discipline them. And if you love your children, you will set forth rules that if they are broken, they will come with consequence. God has done the same thing for us. Now, before we get into this sermon, I want to just go ahead and define a couple of things. Because what we have done as a society, now I'm not just talking about Americans, I'm talking about worldwide. What we have done is we have taken definitions that are meant to be solid, right? And we've twisted them and we've turned them and we've made them where they are different for everybody. Guys, wrong is wrong and right is right. There is no such truth that says what's wrong for you is right for me. No, what's wrong is wrong. Therefore, if I do it, I am wrong. And if you do it, you are wrong. It's the moment that we start taking and twisting these things that everything gets turned on its ear and all of a sudden, the words of Isaiah start to ring more and more true every single day. Now, the other thing that I want us to remember as we come in here, what, what, I almost skipped the definition. Definition of evil is that which is against God's nature, way, will, or his creation. So, God's nature, God's will, God's way, God's creation. God will never, ever, ever contradict any of those things. God will not contradict his creation. God will not contradict his will. God will not contradict his way. And God will never contradict his word. All of those things are in black and white. We can't make little gray areas, even though 
our lives don't fit the black and white. See, it's when our lives don't fit the black and white that we need to make adjustments to our lives. It's not when our lives don't fit the black and white that we need to make adjustments to the black and white. We don't need to add or remove pigment. What we need to do is we need to adjust our lives in accordance with God's way, God's will, God's nature, and God's creation. Y'all get what I'm saying so far? I want nods because this is important. All right, good. The second thing that I want us to realize is we are not Israel. (laughs) I've said this many times. You will hear people tell you sometimes, we are Israel. No, we're not. Absolutely not. We are not Israel. We are citizens of the United States. I believe most of us are. I've never been an Israelite. Never claimed to be. We are under the covenant of Jesus Christ. That's not to say that no one in Israel is under the covenant of Jesus Christ. However, if we read Revelation, we see that there is a distinct difference between the Christian and the Jew. So what, what is, is his plan for the Jew is different than his plan for the Gentile, which is us. But the plan is no less grand, and the plan does end in the same way. It's just a little different route to get there. So we are not Israel. So what I want to understand is I want us to understand that as I read these things, these are things that Isaiah was predicting for Israel. Isaiah wrote this around 740 B.C. It came to fruition in 721, which is 19 years later, and then again in 586, which, let me do the math in my head, 740, 100... And I'm, I'm bad at math. About 180 years. So about 180 years. So about 180 years later, guys, listen, he was dead on. Every prophecy in the Bible has come true. The ones that have been, you know, as of yet. Now there's going to be more that come true with the end of times, day of the Lord, however you want to put it. But if I told you the winning lottery numbers one day before the lottery, y'all would be like, oh my gosh, he is the greatest. There's over 2,000 examples of people doing that in the Bible, and we're like, "Ah, that's not true. The proof is there. (laughs) The next thing that I want us to remember is that God is immutable. Immutable is a fancy word. Immutable means God is unchanging. God has been the same since the beginning of time. God's love has always looked like God's love. God's anger has always looked like God's anger. God's rules have always been God's rules, and God's way has always been God's way. It does not change. Now, the mode in which he applies those things, absolutely it does change. In, with Israel, it was a corporate usage of the Holy Spirit which means that someone was endowed with the Holy Spirit, and they led Israel into that place where Israel was supposed to be holy. Christ, we are endowed with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit dwells with us, and we are led to holiness, just like in the Old Testament, by the Holy Spirit, but as individuals. So it doesn't change the way that God thinks, and it doesn't change what God is. It just changes the way that it was applied. And I want us to do that because I want us to have understanding of the Scripture that is about to be read. Because the scripture that is about to be read is very crucial to each and every one of us. In Isaiah chapter 5, starting with verse 8, it says, Woe to those who join house to house and field to field until there is no more room. And you are made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. So he's saying, Woe to those who have become, because of their riches or because of their prosperity, bad stewards of what I have given them. Woe to you that is taking more than you need. Woe to you that is taking more than you'll use. Woe to you who is abusing, over-consuming. Woe to you who is greedy. Woe to you 
who is stockpiling what you do not need when you have neighbors that are in need. And then he goes on to say, The Lord of hosts has sworn in my hearing, Surely many houses shall be desolate, large and beautiful houses without inhabitant. For ten acres of a vineyard shall yield but one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield but one ephah. They can have the biggest, finest vineyards, the greatest fields, and they're going to yield nothing because no one's going to be there to tend to them. There's going to be a time when the Lord takes that away, and all of that, all of that fancy stuff and all the, the hoarding that they did, it's not going to mean a thing. Number one, what are we yoking ourselves to? Are we yoking ourselves to our stuff here, or are we yoking our stuff? ourselves to the things eternal? Are we yoking ourselves to the Lord? Are we yoking ourselves to what is right? Now, that's not to say that wealth is bad. I'm not up here saying that wealth is bad because people that, that, that obtain wealth, they, they, many of them do it through hard work. Many of them do it through, and that you can have nice things. But when you become an abuser of that wealth and you neglect those that are in need, then it becomes a problem. See, wealth in and of itself is not a problem. But when we remove God, because if we keep God in it with our wealth, those around us will prosper as well, correct? But when we remove God, we become those people that are dwelling alone in the midst of the land. We've isolated, we've separated, we've made ourselves different because of our prosperity. Woe to those who rise early in the morning, that they may run after strong drink, who tarry late into the evening as wine inflates them. They have lyre and harp, tambourine and flute, wine at their, fle- at their feast, but they do not regard the deeds of the Lord or see the work of his hands. Woe to the person who is consumed with the good time here on earth. I'm not here for a long time, but I'm here for a good time. How many of y'all have said that? I've said it. Yes. Well, the truth of the matter is, if we are focused on the the, the ways of the Lord and we're focused on, on, on Christ and we're focused on God, we are here for a long time. It's eternity. See, but, but in the, 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 the focusing of the good time, we get trapped into the pleasures of the flesh. The pleasures of the flesh draw us away from the Lord, and we ignore the Lord. We fail to see God in the things. We focus purely on the empirical. We talked about the empirical in Bible study the other day, but it's, it's the things that are yoked to our senses, smell, taste, sight, touch, hearing. The things that we can feel Physically, they give us a little tickle, give us a little joy every now and then. But you see, those things are not lasting. Those things are temporary. The man who tarries after strong drink wakes up in the morning with hangover. That's an ancient Chinese proverb. Not really. But I think that there's a lot of people here that understand, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I'm sorry to cast this dispersion on y'all. But I think that there's a lot of people that can, can, can verify what I'm about to say. And yes, those things feel good when you first do them. But eventually they consume you. You are far, far, far away from God. And you are trapped in a place that you don't know how to get out of. Now, I may be wrong, like I said. I don't think I am, considering I lived it. But you see... 740 B.C. So that's 2,066 years ago. 2,062 years ago. 2,062 years ago, God was telling his people, don't yoke yourself to these things. It's going to be damaging to you. Yet we think it's a new problem. The people in Israel were doing the same thing. And it was drawing them away from fellowship with God. See, they had made a covenant 
much like the covenant that you make when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that he would be their God and they would be his people. He's saying your greed and your desires of the flesh are drawing you away from me. I don't know you anymore. That's a scary thought, guys. That's a scary thought that we can allow things into our lives that will block our relationship with God so much that he does not even recognize us. But it's a truth and it's a harsh reality. Now, I'm not saying that that God's grace is not present because God's grace is present every single day. But we have the ability to accept God's grace or to deny God's grace. See, if, 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 if our moment in Christ is just a fleeting moment and it's not real, if we just say, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to go back to doing whatever I'm going to do, that's not real salvation. That's not real knowledge of God. That's not real relationship. See, we hear the, the, the religion versus relationship argument all the time. You can't have just one. You've got to have both. You've got to have an understanding of God which comes from true religion, which comes from true interpretation of Scripture, which comes from a true place of desiring to know and learn. But you also have to have a relationship which comes from humbleness, which comes from a willingness to, to, to submit to God and say, you know what, God, I am being greedy. How do I turn away from my greed? God, I am stuck in the, the sins of the flesh. How do I turn away from those sins of the flesh? I need you to light that path. I need you to carry me through it. I need you to take me because I'm incapable of doing this on my own. Now, he's talking to to the Israelites, and, and believe me, they are not liking this. And then it says, therefore, my people go into exile for lack of knowledge. Not lack of knowledge of the world around them. They understood the world around them. They understood how to go shopping. They understood how to go to bars. They understood how to accumulate money. They understood how to pick up women, how to pick up dudes, whatever. They understood how to worship false gods. They understood the world very, very well. The knowledge they were lacking was the knowledge of God. And like I said, he's saying this in 740. Israel did not go into exile with the Assyrians until 721, 19 years later. So he's saying this 19 years ahead of time in the hopes that someone would wake up in Israel and say, you know what? He's right. We're yoking ourselves to the wrong things. We're we're following the wrong things. This land that he led us to, remember he took them out of slavery brought them into a place of prosperity, a land that yielded greater than any other nation during that time span. Solomon and the kings immediately after him, they were very wealthy. They were, they were, they were great to trade with, but what they had done is they had, they, had, they had built relationships with all these people and brought in all these falsehoods, all these lies of the world, and they were clinging to those as opposed to clinging to God. And Isaiah is saying, because you are ignorant of God, and he probably said it a little different, it didn't sound like ignorant, because you are ignorant of God, you're going to be exiled. All of this wonderful stuff that he has given you is going to disappear. Here's here's the kick to the gut. That's what false salvation is. That's what false salvation is. That's what happens when you say that you are with God, but you don't truly know God. That's what happens when you try to give God lip service. That's what happens when you say, I love you, God, I give myself to you, and then you don't share with him one ounce of yourself. You walk around with a false security thinking that you've received something that at the end of the day you're not going to have. See, they had, they, had, they had journeyed through the wilderness. They had, they had built this community. They had expanded this community. They had done all these things, but they had left God out of it. And Isaiah is saying, because you have left God out and because you are ignorant of him, you're going to be exiled. 
Their honored men go hungry. So the people that were putting themselves on the pedestals, they're going to be hungry. No matter how many vineyards, how many houses, no matter how much they have, they're going to go hungry. Their multitude is parched with thirst. The people are going to be thirsty. They're going to be desiring water, desiring something to quench their thirst. But the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice, and the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. God is going to preserve those who know him. God will serve true justice. False piety, God doesn't care. God doesn't want it. False righteousness, God doesn't want it. We can fast forward. We can fast forward to the time of Christ. What did Christ say about the the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees? I don't want your sacrifice. It doesn't mean anything. You worry more about the outside of the cup than the inside of the cup. That's exactly what Israel was doing at the time. They were worried about the outside appearance, but they let the inside decay. It says, Then shall the lambs graze in their pastures, and the nomads shall eat among the ruins of the rich. All of those things did not matter. What mattered was what was inside. Woe to those who draw inequity with cords of falsehood, who draw sin as a cart with ropes. False righteousness, absolutely. False righteousness gets people in trouble. False righteousness gets people in trouble. The church is full of false righteousness. And it's those people that challenge the Lord and say, let him be quick. Let him speed his work. That way we may see it. Those are the very people that don't want to see it. Those are the very people that, 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 that don't want to see what God's plan looks like. See, they think that because they, they, they make this donation or because they dress a certain way or because they do this or they do that or because they stick to the ritualistic that they are good. But there is no relationship there. There is no truth there. The things that they care about are not the things of God, but the things of the world. It says, let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near, and let it come that we may know it. Heart versus acts. And the very next line is something that we need to pay close attention to. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Sound familiar? Are we there today? I mean, let's think about it. Are we there today? As you know, I don't, I don't do the, the whole political thing. It's not my job. If you ask me, both political parties are... Uh, are just as equally as guilty and just as bad. As a matter of fact, if you really want to know where I stand last election, I didn't vote at all because there was no good choice. That's where I stand. I stand with God. I couldn't make a choice between humanity and human life. It was impossible for me to make that, that choice and say that I was, I was doing the will of God either way. So I had to abstain from the vote. I didn't care about tax breaks. I didn't care about any of that stuff. I really don't care how much gas costs right now. If you really think you're, you're hurting, go to Oslo. Oh, my gosh. I was over there 15 years ago. It was $8 a liter. We've had it pretty good. But woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Now, the reason that I just gave my political, you know, my political spiel was I just wanted to point out that on Friday, Roe versus Wade was overturned. It is shocking how many people that have themselves yoked to a church are saying that we're going back to the 1950s, are saying that we are stealing the autonomy of a woman's body, that are saying that that, that the overturning of the legalization of abortion is bad. 
Let's examine for just a moment. If we look at the, the, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder. Murder is the taking of an innocent life. Innocent life, a life within someone that has not come out yet, has never done any evil to anyone. Am I correct? Okay. Number two, when does the life begin? See, this is where we start to bend into gray areas and everything else. Well, if we read Scripture, especially Psalm 139, David says that God knew him before he was in the womb. God says he knew his inward parts. He said that God knew him and his deeds before he came out. When an embryo is formed, there's a genetic code for him, which makes another person. And as far as the argument of autonomy of a woman's body, the autonomy of a woman's body has never been violated. The natural outcome of sex is pregnancy. That's nature. That's science. You want to argue science? That's science. Sperm meets egg equals baby. Natural outcome. You want to argue the autonomy of a woman's body? She has every right to say, no, I don't want to have sex. Then you're going to throw the rape argument at me. I get it. I understand. Just because someone else is guilty does not mean that that child is guilty. There is an option to give that child up for adoption, foster care, whatever. We have foster parents and people that want to adopt in this church right now. It's a hard argument to say that, that saying it is evil to make abortion illegal is right. But we knew these days were coming. And you see, these days have already happened in Israel. In Israel during that time, things were happening that were evil that the people were calling good. And what did God do? You see, that's where we're about to go. Because when we trade and we call evil good and call good evil, we put darkness for light and light for darkness, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Woe to those who take the black and the white and make it gray. Woe to those who want to add to or take away from these scriptures. Woe to those who want to bend, shape, and manipulate the rules so that they fit their lives. Again, autonomy. You had every ability to say no. I don't want to have sex. And when it ends in the natural outcome of pregnancy and it's inconvenient, Let's make a gray area so it's not inconvenient to me any longer. That is us manipulating thou shalt not kill. That is not to be manipulated. That is not attached to any political party. That is not attached to any, any, any right, left, whatever. That is attached to the word of God. Murder is murder. And shrewd in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine. I've been one of those. And valiant men at mix, mixing strong drink. Who equip the guilty for a bribe and deprive the innocent of his right. See, this was happening a lot in Israel. People were being convicted on bribe. See, the Mosaic Law said that there had to be at least two witnesses. Well, if you only had one witness, it was a he said, she said. So what they would do is they'd bribe another witness so that they could convict, take property, whatever they needed to do, but it was not right. They were denying the person who was being tried of their rights. That's evil. Same thing is happening today, though. Have you all ever seen a, a real court case come together? I've been on the wrong side of a couple It's amazing what they can come up with. On either side, there are people that deserve to be in jail walking free at this very moment. And there are people that deserve to be free sitting and rotten in jail at the same time. It all depends on the quality of your lawyer and how much money you've got. Therefore, as a tongue of fire devours the stubble, as a dry grass sinks into the flame. Their root will be as rottenness, and their bosom go up like dust. 
For they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people and he stretched out his hand against them and he struck them. Now Isaiah is speaking in the, in the past tense here because he sees it. He already knows that it's happening. He already knows that this is what the Lord is going to do. But the people of Israel, they're like, this isn't going to happen. Look around us. We're in the greatest point of our prosperity ever. We have more money than we've ever had. We have more trade than we ever had. We have nicer things than we ever had. Look at our crops. Look at our animals. Look at the education that we have. We have all these wonderful things. Isaiah, shut up. We don't want to hear that. There's no way that God would do that because we deserve this. Whoa. We deserve this? See, but that was the attitude that prevailed in Israel at the time. We deserve this. And if you don't believe me, read the scriptures. Read Chronicles. Read Kings. Read the book of Samuel. And look at what the king said to these prophets. They would say, get away from me. I have a prophet who will tell me what I want to hear. I have a prophet that will tell me that we're going to prosper for the rest of eternity because we deserve this. Bring me my food. See, but Isaiah was speaking truth. And when someone speaks truth, a lot of times we don't like it because it steps on our toes. The truth hurts. That's a real statement. The truth does hurt, especially when the truth is contrary to the way that we are living. The truth was contrary to the way that Israel was living, and this is what was going to happen. And it said, and the mountains quaked, and their corpses were, were as, as refuse in the midst of the streets, for all his anger had not turned away. His hand is stretched out still. He will rise a signal for nations far away and whistle for them from the ends of the earth, and behold, quickly and speedily they will come. Assyria in 721 came and took Israel. Shoop. There it went. And because of the sins of Solomon, the kingdom had been divided into two kingdoms, Judah and Israel. Well, Israel was the first one to fall. There it went, under the control of the Assyrians. So all of the wealth and all of the things that they said they deserved, God said, I'll show you how much you deserve them. I'll take them away from you. I will remove them from you, but I promise them to you. So I will restore them once you learn that I am God. See, that's not the place that we want to be as a people. We don't want to be at that place where God has to really show himself who he is. Yes, God is kind. Yes, God is great. God is, is full of grace. He's full of mercy. But if we don't know God and we are ignoring God, there is going to be something in our lives that happens that makes him right there in front of us. And that's what that was to Israel. You've got all this stuff. You've got all this prosperity. I'm taking it back. I'll give it back to you when time is up. And then in 586, Nebuchadnezzar came in. Babylon took Judah. We read about the Babylonian captivity in the book of David. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego getting thrown into the fiery furnace. David, interpreting the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar. We read about how, how, how brutal Nebuchadnezzar was in Jeremiah when, when it says that, that he took the king of, his, of, of Judah and killed his two sons and then poked the king's eyes out so that that was the last thing that he saw. These were not gentle and kind people that God sent into Israel to take it over. These were barbarians. These were men of war. God was making a point. You don't want me? I'm dropping my hedge of protection, and I'm letting the world have you. When we don't see God, that's what happens to us. We are not Israel. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. But when we fail to see Jesus Christ, we come under attack just like Israel, just like Judah. When we fail to see God, when we fail to acknowledge God, 
Read Romans chapter 1. When we fail to see God and we claim to be wise, and by proclaiming to be wise, we make ourselves fools, what happens is we get attacked and we are taken. We're taken by the waves of society, by the waves, the frugality, the, 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 the frivolousness of society. Because, you know, I brought up Roe versus Wade, and right now there's outrage on one side, there's praise on the other, but you know what? Those winds will change because anytime society swings too far one way, the pendulum will swing back just as far the opposite direction five to ten years later because we don't know how to correct things on our own. We always overcorrect. It's like driving a car and you start to drift over the line to the left and you jerk the wheel to the right and you wind up in a ditch. That's what we do over and over and over again when we try to correct these things on our own. But as brutal as those things were, God did restore Israel. Isaiah also predicted the exact date and year in which Israel would become a nation again. 1948. They were released from the Babylonian captivity 70 years after they were taken captive and allowed to return to Jerusalem. Unfortunately, it went under many other kings. It went under many other empires and eventually ended up under the Roman Empire. But they were restored and they were allowed to live in their land again. God took, and when they saw them and when they finally acknowledged him and finally gave themselves to him like they needed to and like he desired and like he wants, not because of him, because of us. Because he wants to protect us from those things that take us. Over and over and over again. But you see, here's the thing about it. There's never going to be a day where the entire world believes. It's unfortunate. It, that means that heaven is very real and hell is very real. There's a lot of people that, that do not like the idea of hell. Well, me personally, I don't like the idea of hell either. It sounds terrible. <laughs> don't want to go there. It's not on my itinerary. But there are cults and false religions that have completely taken hell out of the equation and said that we either just go to the dirt or everyone goes to heaven. Man, that's dangerous theology right there. Theology, religion, that's dangerous theology. Everyone goes to heaven. We're not dogs. All dogs go to heaven. Saw the movie. Yeah, I did, twice. <laughs> We don't all go to heaven. All of us who know God go to heaven. And there's going to be a day of real judgment. Now, this day of judgment sounds very harsh, but it's actually a beautiful thing because it is true justice. It is removing all the gray and it is sticking it to the black and white. In Revelation chapter 20, starting with verse 11, it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him, him being Jesus Christ, was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. I mean, imagine this, the great white throne, Jesus Christ sitting there. I told you, I say it all the time, you know, eternity is that instant. You know, you leave here, and then you're standing before Christ. And, and, and it's all these people lined up, all these people that have, that have, have gone through life, that have, have been, you know, waiting for the judgment. These are people that, 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 that just didn't, didn't get it. It says, then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. I'm going to get to that in just a moment. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one on according to what they had done. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone's name not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This comes at a pivotal point in Revelation. It's the judgment and at this point, Jesus has already come and established a millennial kingdom where there was peace for a thousand years. 
And these people that were born into the, the peace, and the, even the people that had made it through the tribulation that had never seen peace in their lives, because I've never seen peace in my life. Have you ever, has anyone here ever lived through a day where there was no war somewhere in the world? No. But when Christ comes and sits on that millennial throne, there's peace for a thousand years. Yet there's still people that deny him. There's still people that are like, oh, he's not the Messiah. He's not God. I am. Obviously. But then it says that the people are judged for what they have done. Guys, if we were judged by our own merit, every single one of us would be getting thrown into the lake of fire. There is zero doubt about that. There is not one of us here that is righteous enough to be justified to enter heaven. Your pastor included. Your pastor especially. But by what they had done, what they had done, you see that, that statement is so rich in meaning. What they had done is they had yoked themselves to Jesus Christ. What they had done is said, I see that the world is giving me nothing but lies. I see that the world is giving me strife. I see that the world is giving me terror. I see that the world is giving me death, and I can't do it. I give myself to you because you are the Savior. Just as Teresa said earlier, you are the Savior. You are the one that can take me and make me whole. You are the one that can give me life. You are the one that can give me everything that I've ever desired, everything that I've ever lacked, and everything that I can't attain. I am imperfect. I am flawed. I am a screw-up. But I give myself to you to do what you will with it. I am yours. That is what it means. They are judged by what they did. They are judged by that spirit of humbleness that each and every one of us is going to have to develop if we want to even catch a glimpse of heaven. Israel had become too callous. Israel had forgotten all the things that God did for them. We talked earlier about coming in and celebrating and remembering the battles that we fought and all the things that God has done for us. Israel forgot every bit of that. And they were taken into exile. They were given punishment. They were given consequence for their actions. We said the word immutable at the beginning of this service. If God is never changing, why do we believe that he will not judge us just as he judged Israel? Let that sink in for a moment. There is real judgment coming. But the great news is, and that's why it's called the gospel, the good news is what it translates to. The good news is, that the blood of Christ atones for your sins, past, present, and future. No matter how wretched you were before you knew Christ, you are made anew. No matter if you slip up, the blood of Christ is strong enough to cover that sin. But in order for the blood of Christ to, to cover a sin, we have to acknowledge a sin. We cannot stand in that place and be the people that call evil good and good evil. That's not acknowledging a sin. How can, how can I say you are forgiven, Gary, if you won't admit that you wronged me? We can't go through the world with our blinders on thinking that we can just follow the waves because guess what? People are going to get mad when you share the truth. That's the fact. People are going to call you names. People are going to end relationship with you, and you are going to end relationship with people. And that is fine. Some of the people are going to be people that you love. And sometimes... By terminating that relationship, it opens their eyes, and they come to know the truth as well. But 
But understand that without Christ, there is judgment. Well, either way, there's judgment. But without Christ, there is no atonement. And we will be judged on our merits, not his. That's scary to me. I don't want to be judged on my merits because I know what I am. That's why we need to be thankful. That's why we need to be bearers of Christ. That's why we need to live the life that we're called to live. And guys, it's a wonderful life if we are following Christ. That means that we get to help the widowed, the afflicted, the poor. That means that we get to acknowledge that that we're not the greatest thing. Once we step back and we let someone else be in charge, that takes a lot off of our shoulders. And the fact that we can be viewed through the eyes of Christ, the way that uh, the way that He sees us, truly is humbling. So as we go out this week, what I would ask each of us to do, again, this is one of those self-evaluation things. I can't say it for you. Look at your belief system. What do you believe? And I'll tell you this too. If your belief system does not match up with mine, I still love you. I'll tell you this also. If your belief system does not line up with mine, Jesus still loves you. But I want you to explore and see where your beliefs are. And if you look at them through the spectrum of Scripture and through the spectrum of Christ, are your beliefs where they need to be? That's the second part, and that's the challenging part. Because our beliefs need to align with his word. If they don't align with his word, We cannot align with his way, nor can we align with his nature. Y'all dig? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to receive your holy word. I thank you for the praise and worship that we enjoyed today, Lord. I thank you for all the things that you've given us, Lord. I thank you for the grace and the mercy that has been afforded to us through the precious blood of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that as we we walk through this week, I pray that we evaluate where we stand on certain issues, certain things, and, and see if we align with you, Lord. Lord, so many times we get inflicted and infected by the world and don't even realize it. Lord, let us take this time to truly meditate and pray on the things that are important. Lord, we love you. We want to honor you with all that we do. Allow us to do so with truth and allow us to do so understanding that real justice does lie ahead. Lord, we we thank you for giving us the ability to, to humble ourselves and we thank you for giving us a Savior when we didn't deserve it. Lord, I pray that many more come to know you. I pray that many more come to know the truth. And I pray that many more come to love you and build true relationship with you. Not lip service, not false righteousness, not false piety. Real relationship that can only come through real understanding. Let us be an educated people. Let us not be a people infected by ignorance. Let us not be a people infected by prejudice. Let us understand that we were created in your image for a purpose. And let us fulfill that purpose each and every day. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. If any of y'all had prayers or anything that you uh, need to be prayed for, the the altar is open. Pastor Gary is going to close out service today right after the altar call. at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you and where your love ran rest in my sin wash white I hold on to you I hold on to you at the cross at the cross 
surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. And where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe it all to you. I owe it all to you. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you, where your love ran red, and my sin washed white. I hold you. Amen. That's where it all changes, at the cross, at the foot of the cross. And like I said last week, bring those burdens and lay them there. Uh, this week, like every week, it's a full week. Monday night is the uh, Overcomers Outreach, 7.30, right here. Uh, pastor says it all the time, that's a... Uh, Christ-centered AA meeting, NA, that 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 you can acknowledge that Christ is is what uh, got you to that point where you know you need to change and where you want Him in your life to help you make that change. Tuesday nights is the ladies' Bible study, not this week. Putting a hold on ladies' Bible study till further notice. Uh, but we do have the high set, and that is the. Oh, okay. Well, now we don't have the high set. Eighth of July. All right. Yes, the ladies are on vacation, so eighth of July. Well, it's just a couple weeks, so. They'll be putting a, putting the brakes on that for a couple of weeks, but don't miss out. If you need that diploma, it's a great opportunity. Get in there and get your diploma, get you a couple years of free uh, college. Wished I had done that earlier in my life. Still thinking about it. Uh, the Lord's given me extra time. Maybe that's why. We'll see. Uh, of course, Wednesday night, Pastor and I will be here. Uh, Deuteronomy 7, right, Pastor? Yes. Be in Chapter 7. I missed last week. Uh, I'm not. I'm feeling a little rough. Comes and goes, but I know I can feel your all's prayers. It gets me up. It gets me moving. And I love it. I thank you all. So Wednesday night, we have uh, 7 o'clock right here in the church. If you can't be here, it's online, but I pray that you can show up. Uh, Thursday night, there'll be nothing this week. Of course, it'll be high set with a re reset, high set or reset, July 8th. Uh, Friday night, we uh, we don't have anything going on. I know that Pastor said we're going to have another dinner and a movie, and I'm sure it'll be on a Friday night. I can't wait. That last one was awesome. Uh I seen it again. I watched it again on uh, Daystar, Christian channel that comes on, on on TV. I seen it last weekend. I was just flicking around and I seen it, and I was like, "Wow!" So I watched it again. It's it, it's great. It's awesome. So I can't wait for another one. Uh, Saturday, where's Shirley? Laundry ministry is on. Uh, anybody? Everybody? This your chance to do some kingdom work. Amen. Uh, excuse me? Oh, yeah. And she said thanks to everybody that did show up yesterday. Uh, did you, same place right over here? Right over here on uh, South Rhone, across Mole, Guacamole, Washerama. <laughs> be there, be square. I know he'll be there. 
it's, it is. It's a, it's a great opportunity. It's real fulfill, fulfilling. And what better chance to share the gospel? When you get somebody's clothes, you get them in the washing machine, they ain't leaving. <laughs> not until you get done with them anyway. I mean, we're not, we're not pushing ourselves on anybody, but we do want to spread the gospel. And we're commanded to do that, and we need to do it gently and lovingly. And uh, just a great opportunity. I'd like to say I'll be there. Lord willing, I'm, I'm going to be there. And then, of course, again next Sunday, we'll be right back here at 11 o'clock yeah. for another great sermon. I know I say it every week, uh, that one stepped on my toes. And that's awesome. I mean, if, if you're not getting your toes stepped on, then you're not paying attention because it's for all of us. Hey, Sadie. It's for all of us. It really is. There's Cam, too. That, I hear you got a birthday, huh? Happy birthday. <laughs> He's celebrating his birthday. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I would love to see everybody back again next week. And uh, now here, these are the most important things that we, that we, can, we can do is these, these prayer requests, you know, and, and, and uh You'd be surprised when we go out, we go to the store, and you ask anybody, is there something that you pray for them about? They're, they're kind of taken aback at first, but generally they open up to you. You know, they'll tell you, hey, yeah, I've got this going on. I need you. I need prayers. My, my parents are sick, or, or I, I've got a big test coming up, and uh, I need help with it. I mean, you'd just be surprised at how many people will open up if you just – Give them that opportunity. Open that door for them. And, uh, yeah, just always, you know, I always, I always ask people. And it's a great blessing to know that, that somebody thinks enough that you can, that you, you've got a door to the Lord. And we all can go boldly before the throne of grace. That's what it says in, in the Word. Go boldly and, and let Him know our wants, our, our needs especially. He knows everything, but just like a parent, they want to hear it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we got uh, this first one. I'm not sure who uh, who put it down, but it says Pastor Scott and his family. Is that your writing, Brandon? Is that you? Pastor Scott and his family. Always, always pray that pray that you know that that the Lord would keep giving our pastor encouragement and give him souls for his labors. Uh, that's, the, that's why he does this. It's not for him. He doesn't do it to glory in himself. He does it to bring people into the kingdom. Uh, Tabitha Edwards' mother, she's been sick. Keep her in, in our prayers. Uh, Candy's son, Draven Green. Is that who you put on? Uh, Draven Green and uh, fiance? No, that was uh, Grayson. I'm sorry. Pray for Teresa and her arm. Another ter different Teresa. But Lord, the Lord knows who we're talking about. That's the main thing. He knows. Uh, pray for JF to regain his focus. Amen. Amen. I lose mine sometimes. And that's that's the prayer that, that, that I constantly pray is that, that he open my heart and my mind and that I keep focus on the things that are important. Uh, here's Brandon. Brandon asked for a blessing for Jared Bryant, Doug McCracken, Rusty Isaacs, Logan Tester, and Thomas Barrett. That, that's our graduates. Uh, they graduated 180 program yesterday. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. On their life after 180. Uh, I did say Jared, didn't I? Yeah, he was the first one. Jared Bryant, Doug McCracken, Rusty Isaac, Logan, uh, Tester, and Thomas Barrett. I would never forget. Oh, well, somebody put Jared Bryant. Or meant, we meant Jared Thornton. I, but, yeah, keep Jared Bryant in your prayers as well. 
uh, and Austin to keep his inner peace and to make his way to Christ. Now, Austin's been struggling. He's missing his family. Keep, keep Austin in your prayers. He's a great guy. Holly asks that we pray for her family, her personal relationship growth, and her dad's health. Absolutely. Family and friends. Katie asks that, uh, oh, her mom has COVID. So keep Katie's mom in, in, in our prayers. Candy and Candy's friend that passed and family and friends. And uh, Eric Brooks. Eric's still here. Yeah, Eric. Uh, pray for Eric, his loneliness and depression and his healing. He's had some health issues and and uh, we know that that through the Lord, he is the he is the great physician. I know it firsthand. I can testify to that. Uh, and I'm glad to see that Tiffany's back with us. Let's keep her in, in her prayers, uh, her health. Uh, and Matt, they do a great job with these kids. You know that it's an awesome family. Just keep that. The, the brave family in your prayers. They're, they're awesome people. Now, let's keep all, everybody, all one another in prayer. We, 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 can only, uh, we can only forge ahead through prayer, through great love and, and that, uh, that Jesus has put in our hearts for one another. You know, that is the greatest commandment, to love others as we love ourselves. And, you know, outside of, uh, outside of Jesus, nobody loves you like you love you, right? So let's show that to other people as well. I will close out with a word of prayer. Father God, we do thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us and this great service and this great message that we've heard that you prepared through our pastor. Lord, we thank you so much and pray that we would just take it and hide it in our heart, live it out daily. Thank you for the testimonies we heard today. Pray for all these people that have been mentioned here. You are the great physician. You know everyone by name and need. And I know, Lord, that only you can heal and only you can comfort. And I pray that you would. Pray that you just be with each and every one of us. Put it in our hearts to be here to the next appointed time. Keep us all safe in your will. And everything that we do, we would glorify you. We would honor you. I pray that you would. Just forgive me where I fail you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Matt, Matt, when we going golfing?